Good afternoon and welcome back to Gaston Hall. I hope that the concurrent sessions you attended were informative and inspiring. We turn now to our panel. In envisioning this year's panel, our board was particularly struck by the state legislative victories of the past year and decade in passing life-affirming laws. According to data from Americans United for Life, in 2019, we saw the passage of 60 life-affirming laws in state legislatures across the country. Moreover, as we look ahead to the legal landscape of 2020, a potentially crucial decision regarding a Louisiana abortion case will be handed down by the Supreme Court. In a booklet published by Cardinal O'Connor in 1990, he wrote, some people argue that changing laws will not eliminate abortions. It is certainly true that a change of heart is more important than a change of law. What is forgotten, however, is that the law is the great teacher. Children grow up believing that if a practice is legal, it must be moral. Inspired by the words of John Cardinal O'Connor on the relationship between morality and law, we developed the following theme, the consistent life ethic and the law. We are excited to welcome some of the nation's leading pro-life legal academics and advocates to this year's panel. We hope that our panelists will help us to better understand the arguments for life-affirming laws and the relationship between law and public morality more broadly. Before we move into the panel discussion, we would like to remind our attendees again of Georgetown University's speech and expression policy. As an institution of higher education, one specifically committed to the Catholic and Jesuit tradition, Georgetown University is committed to free and open inquiry, deliberation and debate in all matters, and the untrammeled verbal and nonverbal expression of ideas. It is Georgetown University's policy to provide all members of the university community, including faculty, students, and staff, the broadest possible latitude to speak, write, listen, challenge, and learn. It is now my distinct honor to welcome our panelists to the stage. Before I hand the panel over to our moderator, Kim Daniels, I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists. We are truly honored to welcome such distinguished panelists today. We are especially grateful to Kim, Associate Director of the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life here at Georgetown. Beginning on your right, we have Catherine Glenn Foster, President and CEO of Americans United for Life, America's first national pro-life legal organization and the nation's pr premier pro-life legal team. AUL's legal strategists have been involved in every pro-life case before the U.S. Supreme Court since Roe v. Wade. AUL is the pioneer of the state-based model legislative strategy, which works to save lives today and protect mothers and children from ab abortion industry abuses, while undermining the so-called reliance interest adopted by the Supreme Court in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, the false idea that women rely on abortion to succeed in American society. Next, we have Peter Breen, Vice President and Senior Counsel at the Thomas More Society, a not-for-profit national public interest law firm dedicated to restoring respect in law for life, family, and religious liberty. A national expert on issues of law pertaining to life, family, and religious liberty, Peter is a frequent voice in the media and a prolific pro-life advocate. He is the lead Thomas More Society attorney attorney in multiple defenses, both civil and legal, and of David Daleiden, the undercover journalist whose videos exposed Planned Parenthood's involvement in aborted baby body parts trafficking. Carter Sneed is the William P. and Hazel B. White Director of the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture, Professor of Law at the Notre Dame Law School, and concurrent professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame. Professor Sneed is one of the world's leading experts on public bioethics, the governance of science, medicine, and technology in the name of ethical goods. And finally, Mark Rienzi, pr president of Beckett Law and professor at the Catholic University of America, Columbus School of Law, and visiting professor at Harvard Law School. Mark has broad experience litigating First Amendment religious exercise and free speech cases. 
In January 2014, Mark argued before the Supreme Court in McCullen versus Cloakley, a First Amendment challenge to a Massachusetts state a uh, Massachusetts speech restriction outside of abortion clinics. The justices ruled in favor of his clients nine to zero. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you all for being here. I could not be more excited to be here with this panel today. You should know that you are looking at four of the top leaders of the pro-life movement of our generation. Uh, these folks have been doing this at the, most, the highest level in a serious way and made huge contributions to the development of the law and development of our understanding of a consistent ethic of life in the law and in our public understanding of these issues. And I want to start, our organizers today have asked us to start about talking about the interconnectedness between law and public morality. And so to start the conversation off, I want to turn to you, Carter. And I want to ask you, Carter's worked at this, as you heard, uh, at a very high level for a long time. And he really can look at it for us from 30,000 feet or so. He's written about this at its most fundamental level. Carter, open it up for us. Tell us what you think about that yeah. interplay between the two. No, it's, a, it's an essential question. And, and the, what we teach our students at Notre Dame Law School, which make, what makes Notre Dame a special place, is that we teach our students that all law itself is rooted in a particular vision of the good or a, a good that it's seeking to pursue. So law is inextricably intertwined with morality and principles of justice, principles of freedom. People who try to, and there's a natural sort of orientation in our society to say, well, law is one thing, morality is another, we should keep those separately. I can have my opinions, you can have yours. But, and there's a certain truth in that. Not everything that is immoral should be criminalized. Not everything that is moral should be promoted directly by the government. There is a, a lot of space for civil society and private ordering and decision making. But every single law on the books, whether it be a judicial Supreme Court precedent or whether it be a, a part of the state code or a piece of federal legislation, Every law is grounded in a goal of advancing a particular good or avoiding a particular harm. And the richest way to understand law is to drill down to that normative framework and to ask yourself, what is this law trying to do? What is this law trying to accomplish? And the answer is always a normative answer. It's always an answer rooted in a particular moral proposition. This is good or bad. We're going to pursue the good and avoid the bad. Uh, we're going to in induce people or to encourage people to do good things or deter them from doing bad things. Uh, and, and, that's, and, and so the law and morality are inseparable. There's no way to separate law and morality. Uh, every single law is, as I said, uh, rooted in a principle of normativity that's directed to a particular kind of end. And even more deeply than that, by the way, the law at the most fundamental level exists to serve, protect, and promote the flourishing of persons. That's what law is for. Law is not different, is not distinct from the human context. It serves the human context. And so in order for the law to do that, the law has to have a usually unstated, unspecified conception of what a person is and what constitutes human flourishing. Otherwise, the law is arbitrary and capricious and unintelligible. The law has to have an assumption, an underlying assumption about what a person is, who a person is, and what constitutes human flourishing. And in the context of abortion or these other uh, vital conflicts of American public bioethics, um, we have serious what are called boundary questions about who counts as a person and who doesn't count as a person and what, whose good counts as part of the common good and what are the boundaries of the moral and legal community. That's the fundamental question posed by the, the, the issues uh, surrounding legal questions of abortion. And, what, what, and the answer, of course, the pro-life answer to the question of who counts is that everybody counts. From conception to natural death, everyone belongs, everyone is a member of the human family uh, from conception to natural death, and, the, the, and equal protection on, under the law, if it means anything, is that every person, regardless of her age, size, circumstance, condition of dependency, or the opinion of others, is entitled to our moral concern and support and the protection of the law. I think that's, we all believe that, right? We all see the connection between law and morality. And it's important as a movement to think about that and then to say, how do we put that into practice? At a practical level, what do we do? So Catherine, I want to turn to you. Your organization, AUL, I just have so much respect for. I mean, you've really been a pioneer in bringing these principles to the state level and passing legislation that advances our cause. Can you talk a little bit about what this looks like at the state level? Sure. You know, when we go to the states, um, there, there's a couple of states I like to point to. One of them is Connecticut. 
Connecticut, they have tried, um, the other side has tried for years to try to pass uh, a bill on physician-assisted suicide or suicide by physician. And it's a situation where they keep introducing this bill to legalize suicide by physician and they keep trying to get it through committee and each year it's gone backwards because each year as as they engage in this effort to try to educate the public and, and make this seem normal, um, this idea that this is, is potentially a, um, the better end, uh, public opinion has gone backwards. The vote in the committee has gone backwards to the point where we haven't even gotten to a vote because, um, because the public opinion has, has, so, um, has so effectuated this kind of groundswell. And it got to the point where Compassion and Choices, it was reported in the news, publicly admitted that, um, that it was going backwards and that if it had come to a vote, it would have set the movement there in Connecticut back by years because public opinion was influencing the law, just as the law influences public opinion we see as well, and I'll get into that in just a second. Um, another state to look at, New York State. Um, we're seeing that, um, that they have been trying for years to try to uh, radicalize abortion there. We saw the Reprodu Reproductive Health Act, in fact, um, get passed, signed into law a year and a couple of days ago. And, um, and we saw some groups of people cheering in the streets. We saw the Empire State Building lit up pink in celebration, just um, this, this shameful, um, a devastating celebration of, of death. And, um, and it was very hard for so many of us to see, but then conversely we saw what the response of the American public was. Rather than that law shaping public opinion, in this case, because it went so far, uh, we saw that in fact um, the percentage of Americans who self-identified as being pro-life began to swing back the other way, double-digit swing. The percentage of Democrats who consider themselves pro-life swung the other way, double-digit swing. Within a month afterwards, we at AUL teamed up with YouGov to conduct a poll, more than 1,000 Americans, and we found that 80% of Americans overall and two-thirds of self-described pro-choice Americans oppose late-term abortion, abortion in the fourth, fifth, sixth month of pregnancy and beyond, when, when that child is viable, when that child can feel pain, um, when that child can live outside the womb, and when the risk to the mother is so much greater. And so we see um, not only this, um, this idea that, that the law can go too far, but then also that the law does shape morality, because for so many people, I'm, I'm post-abortive myself, for so many people, we wouldn't have gone down that path if, we hadn't, if it hadn't been legal. We wouldn't have thought, oh, I, I'm going to go seek something illegal, but, but we believe that because it is legal, that it is a valid option, that it is in some way able to be moral. And, and so as we come into an era of, of increasing skepticism, <clears throat> of, of a time, uh, I, I was revisiting Law and Revolution by the late Harvard professor, Howard Berman, recently. And, um, and I would commit that to your reading if you are interested in history or the law or religion or, or any of these topics that bring many of us to the room today. Um, but one of his, his points there was that we do have this increasing skepticism and people have lost faith in the law and in morality in so many cases. And, and so then the question is, how do we, how do we get back to that? And, and for him, he saw it as, a, as quite a large crisis, as a significant crisis. And I think part of the answer there is to rejoin law and morality and to, to have this broad recognition that in fact law and morality in the state level, at the federal level, it is inextricably intertwined. And so in fact we just, um, we teamed up with Rehumanize International to draft a white paper. Um, it's called Restore the Heart. And this is the, the copy here that I have. Um, it's a draft copy. It's available online, and, and I would love for any of you to just grab a card afterwards and, and take a look and, and provide feedback, because we're talking about how to, how to bring these concepts back together, how to restore faith in the law, faith in morality, and, um, and bring these concepts back together within the, the context of restorative justice when it comes to abortion. Um, this is critical. It's happening at the state level and the federal level, and this is work that we all have to work together to do. Because one of the most important, I, to my mind, the thing, one of the things I love the most about this movement is that 
organizations can work together. And so you're working with Rehumanize International, which has such a great lane. They do so many good things. Uh, it's, it's not the first group that I would have thought of you all working together with, and I think it's wonderful. That's what we need to do is change hearts, and, and that's a wonderful effort. When I was, when I was looking, I, I've known of Peter's work for a very long time, um, but when I had a chance to look at your detailed biography, what struck me so much was that you've had a hand in so many different lanes. So you've been a representative in Illinois in the state legislature. Um, you started a nonprofit that helps women and their children. Uh, and you obviously are an attorney and have worked on these cases as a litigator at ground level. Peter, where from those different perspectives, what do you say about the question how law and morality, public morality, are related? Well, and, and I'll tell you, you know, I, I, I totally agree uh, with what the good professor uh, uh, said about what it means. And, and, but I'll tell you, just from being in a legislature uh, and, and then you know, dealing, with this, dealing with the items uh, across the country, there's a lot of confusion right now. Uh, so, so we might all agree, yes, the law is the teacher and, and all of this, but I can't tell you that the, the average legislator is thinking that way. Uh, and I can't tell you that the average voter is thinking that way. But I might suggest that, that those of us here in this room who now have a little more uh, clarity on the issue could really make a great uh, uh, impact in a society that is extremely confused. Uh, and uh, you know, from just looking at it from a legislative perspective. So I was in Illinois, uh, a state that's gone uh, very you know, red team, blue team. It's gone very blue lately. Uh, but it's surrounded by red states. And uh, dealing with the issue of abortion, uh, the state of Illinois is, is nowhere near uh, the, the ninth month abortions that were just legalized. Uh, we, we don't believe in the taxpayer funding of abortion at the, at the, the citizen level, but it's been made the law of the state. Uh, just, just this past week, the latest abortion numbers came out. We had our first full year of taxpayer funded abortion in Illinois. The number of Illinois abortions went from 32,000 in 2017 to 36,000 in 2018. There are 4,000 fewer Illinois babies alive today merely because of that law being passed. And I was in the legislature when it was passed, and it was signed by a Republican governor, who I then promptly condemned, uh, but it was, which was a lot of fun. Uh, as these, <laughs> he, he, I gave it to him both barrels. Uh, but it, uh, it, but, but it, at the same time, the, the language, these folks didn't, they weren't thinking about the great teaching effect of this. They weren't saying, you know, what is this going to do to our abortion rate and things like that? And what's it going to do to our society? Is it going to coarsen it and cheapen it? Uh, but now we see the effect. Uh, but it is something that, that again, I, I would suggest for folks here, this, this idea that the law is the great teacher, that is not out in society necessarily. Uh, and, and so, you know, and I, I, we mentioned my Daleiden case. You know, those are out in San Francisco, California, uh, which is the worst jurisdiction uh, to litigate a pro-life case in the country. Uh, we've got the Attorney General of California suing David Daleiden uh, for uh, alleged taping violations. Never sued another uh, undercover journalist in the history of the state of California for them solely because he's pro-life. Uh, we have a, a, a jury verdict against us for $2.3 million on, on theories that would shut down undercover journalism across the board. And so I, I, I see a lot of the, in the practical way, I know we're gonna talk more about how we see this going, we've got you know, the, this red team, blue team thing is, is hurting us uh, in, the life, uh, in the life field. And I think for those of us particularly who live in the blue states or near the blue states, being able to reintroduce this idea of the law as a teacher, being able to truly think more deeply about the impact of these laws uh, will help us hopefully to bring about uh, a culture of life uh, generally, because it's not a red team, blue team issue. Completely agree. It's not a red team, blue team issue at all. Uh, and, and Mark, I want to turn to you. Now, I, I'm a lawyer as well by background, and this morning when I was looking into how long we've known each other, I searched Renzi in my email and found 2007, an email from 2007. Some of you were probably little children then. Uh, <laughs> When Mark, uh, we, were, we were talking about a case called Moore Fitz versus Blagojevich in Illinois, a, a right of conscience um, case when pharmacists who didn't want to uh, prescribe drugs that uh, cause abortions. And Mark took the lead on that case, very successful um, on these issues generally. Mark is one of the most successful advocates for the pro-life cause of his generation. He's a professor, um, he is successful at the Supreme Court and appellate level, and really one of our best thinkers. Mom, Mark, please bring it on home for us. What do you think about, everybody's talked about the interplay of law and morality here. We've heard about what it is for the average legislator, for the average citizen. What about for the average judge? Yeah, so, um, 
I agree with you. The law, the law is a great teacher, and the judges have a lot to do with that, right? And ideally, we have judges who think the right way about, about personhood and people and, and what their role is in terms of enforcing the law and, and protecting people. Um, you know, hearing all the comments and thinking about law and morality uh, made me think of, of a great old New York Times editorial that was very pro-life. Um, and I, when I say very old, I mean it was from, it was from 1871. Um, <laughs> Because that's back when the New York Times understood this issue. Um, <laughs> in, in, in 1871, in 1871, the New York Times could write an editorial in which they said that abortion murders tens of thousands of human beings before they see the light of day. Um, they weren't all that confused the way the judges in Roe pretended to be confused about whether an infant in the womb is really alive or not. They just said, no, that's murder. Um, and the American Medical Association back in the 1850s and 60s said it too. And they didn't, have, they didn't have ultrasound the way we do. We have a lot more information than they did. But they knew it because it was true. Um, it was true now, true now. It was true then. Um, what's, what's different over time, I think, really is the law, right? Like what has shifted it to, to now so many intelligent people who you all go to school with, right? very smart people and good people, right? I don't think people who are, pro, who are pro-choice are evil, bad, awful, you know, harmful, terrible people. I think they've got a really bad idea, but I think their really bad idea is often fed by the law, right? The fact that the law says, gosh, I don't, I don't really know if that thing's alive or not, um, gives people cover and lets them conveniently say, well, maybe, maybe it's not really alive, and then, and then I don't have to deal with the uncomfortable thing of telling somebody that's actually wrong and you really shouldn't kill that thing, right? Because that's uncomfortable and nobody wants to do something uncomfortable. Um, and it turns out the law can actually lead to a lot of delusion like that. The law can lead people to having really bad ideas and, and lead very good people to having very bad ideas in a way that, that's really toxic for all of us, um, that's horribly you know, deadly and dangerous, as Peter was saying, for those babies who, who died in Illinois who maybe wouldn't have died if, if the legislature had passed a different law. Um, when I think about that, I think abortion's really not that different from other really bad stuff in our history. Right? Uh, we have a long and, and bad history in many respects of the powerful people in, in society deciding that they can, they can label and decide the humanity of a less powerful group in order to do what they want. Right? So if you think about slavery, what was slavery? Well, slavery was the more powerful white people deciding for a very long time that the less powerful you know, Africans who they dragged over here in slaves weren't quite human enough to get protection, weren't quite civilized enough to be part of society. We don't really have to protect them. Right? And they said the same thing about Native Americans. They're uncivilized savages, so we can take their land and do what we want with them. Right? We said this about the mentally ill when it was easier to, to, to force them in, into institutions and have the government forcibly sterilize them. Over and over again, we have people using the law to say that there's some other less powerful group that isn't human enough, and therefore I can walk all over them and do what I want. Um, and so the good thing is, if you look at our history over time, we tend to come to our senses. It sometimes takes a shamefully long time for us to do it. But over time, we tend to come to our senses. We tend to fix the law. And we, we hopefully will eventually decide that you know, a system that lets people who have grown big enough kill those who are too small and too weak to defend themselves um, is a horrible atrocity and something that's not worthy of our humanity. And so when I look at the law, I think the law helps lock those things in. And that's why I think the fight in the law um, to, to pull those things back is so important. Couldn't agree more. I think uh, the, the fight in the courts uh, over what the law is is vitally important. The fight in state legislatures is also vitally important. Um, let's talk a little bit, now let's talk a little bit about more particular questions with the four of you. And Catherine, I'll start with you. Uh, AUL focuses on state legislatures. What are your goals this year? What are some of your major accomplishments recently? Let the folks know what you're focusing on. Sure, okay. Um, you can hear me, right? I was officially transferred over to this mic, so. Um, you know, uh, if we could take a, a step back quickly, one of the, the major things you may have heard of coming up this year is the June Medical Services v. Gee case coming up before the U.S. Supreme Court that they're going to hear in about six weeks on, on March 4th. Um, extremely important because it's taking a look at a state law from Louisiana that was passed to protect women. The issue in this case is whether an abortion facility has the right to abandon women at the doorstep, whether women in emergency situations due to an abortion, they walked through that facility door, they chose to have an abortion, and some emergency has come up. 
you know, something has gone terribly wrong, as we know it sometimes does, what happens next? Does that woman deserve emergency care or does she deserve uh, potentially, it, it, is she permitted it, to simply wait in an emergency room, um, potentially for hours, not really knowing what's going on? The doctors there don't necessarily have her records, don't really know. Um, I broke my foot last summer. I waited for six hours. It's one thing when you have a broken foot. It wasn't pleasant. But in an emergency life or death situation, what happens next? And so um, the court is going to decide whether a law to ensure that that transfer to the hospital happens smoothly is constitutional. They're going to decide whether the abortion facility has the right to stand in the shoes of their patients trying to strike down this law, trying to protect the patient from them, um, the woman from them. And, uh, and this is critically important. This could shape um, every abortion case, every law going forward, depending on how the court decides. And so we're taking a very close look at this law and a very close look at, um, at the court and what we expect them to do. We, are, uh, we know that, that these kinds of laws save lives. They've saved millions of lives so far, according to the data, according to the science. Uh, literally millions of lives have been saved by life-affirming state laws, protections. And so uh, we're talking about, uh, about how morality and the law are intertwined and how the law may shape public morality, how, how we may decide what, what we may believe is moral based on the law. And, and as I mentioned, that was a large part of what went into my decision to seek an abortion at age 19. I know what happened to me behind those facility doors. I know that I did not get full informed consent or information. For example, I asked to see an ultrasound of my child. It's going on. It's already happening. They have to do it, right? They have to figure out what abortion procedure to use. They have to figure out if the pregnancy is ectopic or not. They have to figure out how much to charge you. They don't just eyeball you and, and come up with a figure. It's all based on gestational age. And, and it's going on. It's two feet away from me is the screen. And I said, let me see that screen. It's part of, of my decision-making process. I don't know what I want to do yet. And they said no. And so one of the things that we're working to do is to ensure that women get informed consent, that women get to see ultrasounds if they want, that women get the data, that we find out what the true complication rate is, because we don't know this kind of thing. A lot of states don't report and don't fully report. We need health and safety standards. We need direct protections for those vulnerable, helpless children in the womb. So we're working on all of these different uh, fronts, if you will, to ensure that we do protect the women, the girls, the children who are at risk in this situation, um, because this is critically important. We know, uh, we know what happens when we don't provide these kinds of protections, and um, and we know that they save lives. It's one of the the main ways that's listed by the CDC ways that lives are saved. I'd like to just end this part with with a quick story of uh, of a woman that I helped, a girl that I helped, a family that I helped a, a few years ago, <clears throat> and uh, and they lived in Indiana, so right next to Illinois. And Indiana had a parental consent law. Uh, Illinois has a, a parental notification, right? And so. Um, and so this, this girl, she was 16 years old. Um, her parents were uh, people of very strong faith, and they called in a panic because it turned out she'd been living this triple life. She had been very engaged in the faith. She'd been um, involved in you know, youth, faith activities, and, and everything. She had a boyfriend. <clears throat> Turns out that they had been engaged in, in some um, um, undesirable activity. Um, and... Um, and so uh, she turned out to be pregnant. Um, triple life, I mentioned. She also was working at McDonald's and had this 24-year-old coworker who was very interested in her. He said, oh, I'll take you across the border to, to Illinois um, to get the abortion there so that we don't have to do the consent in Indiana where her parents were saying, no, absolutely not. We're not consenting. You have so many options. We will stand beside you. We will help you raise this child. You can you know, choose adoption and place the, the child in a loving family. So many options here. Just take a few days to wait and think about it. And so they came and, and they did not know what to do. And, um, and I remember spending so many long hours on the phone with her mom her dad was just beside himself. He was sitting out on the front porch with his guitar, just playing songs and trying to, to regain some peace. But, um, 
but they gained time. Um, I, I think they did something involving her car. I'm not a car person, but they did something because this 24-year-old was going to have to drive her car um, <laughs> to uh, to Illinois to to take her over there. But but they gained some time, and I watched this process happen, counseling the the legal team on the ground who's working on all these different fronts to try to, to try to save this baby and this girl. And over the, those few days, she went from not talking to her parents, slamming doors, about to head to Illinois with this 24-year-old, to, um, to the point where she was asking her mom to take her shopping for maternity clothes. And, um, and a couple of years later, her dad was flying through DC, I live in DC, and he was flying through DC and he said, hey, can you meet? I just wanna, I have a layover. Can you meet me at the airport? I wanna show you pictures. Um, I've been texting you, but I wanna show you, you know, just physical photos of this baby who is now part of our family and just an incomparable part. And, and that to me was this perfect picture of how the law and morality can work together because the law in Illinois, um, it would have permitted her to just go right on over, but the law in Indiana provided that little bit of time. And so even though she knew it was legal and she knew she could, she, she took the time to wait. And sometimes that can make all the difference. It can, and, and it's, a, it's a great example of how sometimes this discussion can seem so abstract and removed from real life. But the point is that these kinds of this legal efforts really do save lives, and, and they can at the most particular and individual level. Um, Mark, we've heard a little bit about what's going on uh, at AUL. Tell us a little bit about, at Beckett Law, what's going on. You all have a, an exciting um, spring ahead of you, and you in particular. Sure, and I, and I should say, I should have said at the outset, I have a lot of employers, as Kim said. Um, I'm not speaking on any of their behalf or any of my clients' behalf. I'm just, just giving my opinions. Um, here's my opinion, um, <laughs> since you all asked. Um, We've got, uh, we're going back to the Supreme Court this April with the Little Sisters of the Poor. Um, I'll, I'll clap for them too. Um, it, it's really an outrageously dumb lawsuit, um, if I can use the technical term, right? The, the idea that the government needs nuns to give out contraception, right? As if like they couldn't possibly find some way to give this out without the sisters, um, is, is just an idiotic idea. And yet, we've spent seven years having to defend the little sisters who just say, look, I want nothing to do with this. Leave me out of it. Um, go do something else, but, but just let me walk away. Um, and governments across this country, including, by the way, Attorney General Becerra, um, the Attorney General of California, has decided to drag the little sisters of the poor into court as if the state of California couldn't possibly come up with some way to distribute these things without nuns. Um, <laughs> So we're defending the Little Sisters of the Poor. We're going back to the Supreme Court this April. Um, it's awful that the sisters have had to go through years and years of litigation. Um, litigation is not fun to go through. Um, but at the same time, I think they recognize that they have an opportunity to stand up, to, to be clear that they care about these things, that this is not just some minor little issue that, okay, I'll go along because some bully in the government wants me to go along, but instead to say, no, this is really important and I can't do it. So one of the things we're gonna do um, is we're gonna win at the Supreme Court this spring for the Little Sisters of the Poor. Um, and then more broadly, and this, this again goes to what, what Peter was talking about, um, we're going to continue fighting for space for people who want to live out their lives being pro-life, right? They, they need the space, they want the space to run a business and be pro-life, like Hobby Lobby had to fight for years ago, to um, be able to speak, right? There's so many people who wanna silence the pro-life message, right? It's crucially important for people to have the room to speak or to be like pregnancy centers, to have the room to offer people help and assistance and information when they're in a bad spot. So um, all of those things are going on in the courts right now, people fighting for those, those types of rights, and it's really important to leave the space for people to live a pro-life life. Eventually, I really do think we're gonna go get rid of Roe and Casey, um, and part of the process of getting there is fighting to leave space for religious groups and just private citizens to be able to have their own view and not simply nod their head when the government or the law tells them, oh, it's not really alive, you can help kill it, don't worry about it. Um, it's really important for citizens to have the ability to say, 
you know what, I I'm actually gonna make up my own mind on that one, and I believe the science, and the government can't bully me. So um, we're gonna be fighting about those things in court now, and probably for, for a while into the future, um, and that's part of laying the groundwork for a pro-life country, and for a good interpretation of the Constitution that eventually, uh, to go back to the way Carter put it, protects all human beings, right? They're, we're all people from conception to natural death, um, and eventually we need to get to the point where the law and our fellow citizens see, see what's, what's absolutely obvious and scientifically clear. Well, absolutely right. And for citizens to have a voice and to be able to, to, to uh, express their pro-life views in the public square, often they need advocates. Uh, you've been an advocate, Peter. Um, do you, you know, what, what space do you want to open up? What are you working on? And also, looking at the young people here, would you, would you, ask, would you tell them to go into a career in law if they want to advance the pro-life movement? It, it, it's funny they're asking me this, because everybody else, I think, was a lawyer and was very excited about being a lawyer and everything else. And I actually got out of it. Uh, <laughs> You know, my, my undergrad was electric, electrical engineering, uh, but I was, uh, I was in politics and things like that. Uh, and actually, I would say, so, so number one is, you do not have to be a lawyer to be great in uh, the pro-life space, whether on the legal side, the pregnancy center side, or what have you. You know, I, I, you know my wife was the Respect Life Director for the Archdiocese of Chicago, and she wouldn't uh, let me date her unless I would go and pray with her at the Planned Parenthood. So, you know, that's the reason I'm here. You know, so, and I, you know, it's funny, you know, she would be here today, except, uh, you know, we, uh, we were unable to have kids of our own. We've been married 15 years almost, uh, but we have a one-year-old and a three-year-old by adoption, uh, and so they're both boys, and they're bruising each other, yeah. <laughs> but if, if they were here, pretty much they would be owning the stage, so we, they're, they're back, at, back at the hotel. I, you know, the, the thing, too, though, it, it, you know, on the other side, uh, I have to come at it from the legislative side. So I was the floor leader for the House Republicans in Illinois, and out of about 50 members, we had maybe four lawyers. And so that was something that made it very, very difficult for us to prosecute our case. Uh, you know, thousands of bills going through, and, and if I had five more lawyers, we would have been able to make an even better uh, presentation and what have you. So, so we do need uh, folks who are called to the law uh, to come forward and, and to be a part of it. Uh, but again, it's, it's, a, it's a special calling. Uh, but either way, I would say you can be involved in the legislative and legal process, uh, it, you know, be there locally. Uh, frankly, I, first thing I would advise anybody who is in, in high school or college is to join uh, whatever political organization is your affiliation, whatever you like, whatever team you like to be on, go in there and be a pro-life voice in that organization. Uh, because that way you get to know what's going on. Even if you just go to the meetings or even just get the emails, you'll, you'll learn more about what is occurring in your, you know, in your area. Uh, and you'll find, I think you'll find, you'll be educated in a way that you just had never known. I mean, I, you know, I got on Facebook the other day, a little reminder, you know, three years ago, you know, this was happening. It was a picture of little Matthew at the time who was, you know, newborn. Uh, being rocked to sleep by the ACLU lobbyist in the state legislature in Springfield. Literally, yeah, so, so you know, totally uh, you know, pro-choice on abortion person, but we were able to have civil conversations. Uh, and it's the sort of thing that uh, you look at and go, you know, we, we can do this, and it is going to have to be the way that we win this fight, uh, particularly as we, you know, as we move to the next phase of this fight where really, you know, as Roe you know, really recedes into the background, I think it'll be overturned soon, uh, you're going to have red states and blue states, you're going to have pro-life states and, and abortion states where we are going to have to work very, very hard uh, in, and again, I, my heart is in Illinois and I see a slew person right here, so St. Louis University in the front row, thank you. Um, you know, I mean, there, yeah. <laughs> All, I mean, but you know, the, the Missourians are now coming over into Illinois to help in Southern Illinois on the pro-life side because you guys have done such a great job over there. Uh, and, and so that is, uh, you know, that, that is the work I see going forward. And anybody, if you are in law school or want to go, Thomas More Society in Chicago, we'd love to have you come intern. We've got over 100 active case matters right now. We've got more work than we know what to do with uh, all over the country. So I mean, th this issue is not going away anytime soon. There's going to be a lot of work uh, even after we're able to overturn Roe. Thank you. Carter, I wanna, I wanna end with you. After we've talked with Carter for a second, we're gonna have questions from you all. And if you have a question, we can line up at a microphone over here. But first, I wanna talk to Carter for a second. Um, 
If you all don't know about the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture, you should. Uh, if you are a pro-life leader, if you want to be a pro-life leader, if you are a pro-life college student, check out their website. It, to, to me, is just the locus of so much energy in this movement, and Carter is a big reason for that. And so, Carter, I want to have you tell these folks, if you're a young person, how do you help build up a culture of life? What can you do? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I mean, the March for Life itself is an energizing moment, I think, for a lot of us. I mean, you, when you look back and we've had abortion embedded in our Constitution by a bad Supreme Court decision followed by another one, you know, you can get down and, and depressed. But the March for Life is so energizing because it is infused with joy and it's infused with youth. And we just sent 800 kids from Notre Dame uh, who rode buses for 24 hours round trip to march in the March for Life. They're on their way back now. We've sent 100 faculty and staff from Notre Dame and it's these young people that are, that are going to, and one of the things we try to do at Notre Dame, and I know you guys do here at Georgetown, is to try to, try to build communities of folks who, uh, who are first, they become friends and they support each other, and then, and because the root of the pro-life movement is this notion of love and friendship. It's, it's joy, it's openness to the other, it's radical hospitality, it's solidarity, it's this beautiful truth about who we are and what we owe to each other, that young people naturally kind of get until it's beaten out of them by bad law professors or college professors, um, and and but but not 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 here or at Notre Dame. But but the point is is that <laughs> is that is that um, is and so and so the, the bottom line is is that the way you can transform the culture as a young person is is to to not. I mean, of course, you want to think broadly about law, politics, and big picture questions, but you need to just love the person that is in front of you and care for the person that is in front of you because that's infectious and it's that kind of prophetic witness, radical love that makes, that moves people's hearts. I could make arguments all day long about morality, justice, bioethics, constitutional law, everybody on here could do the same thing and explain why Roe was bad or why abortion is killing innocent human beings. And, but it's not until you love another person into a kind of conversion that you can actually change hearts and minds. And you know that's why it's, it's, everything is connected. That's why our kids, at, I keep speaking about our kids at Notre Dame because that's who I know, but our kids at Notre Dame march in the March for Life. They take care of moms and families who need help after the babies are born. They go to the Catholic worker house and they serve breakfast to people who need, who need to be helped. They, you know, they, they, they talk about, they try to help refugees. They go to Lampedusa. They, I mean, they, they talk about poverty. This is, I mean, it, the whole, it's one big picture of, and, and one of the gravest injustices that we're facing is the killing of unborn children on an unspeakable scale, licensed by, the, by a terrible constitutional decision. But the way people ultimately change their hearts and minds is by seeing someone else without any calculation or hope of, of getting anything back in return, loving and serving another person and basically the goods of friendship. And young people get that and it's infectious and the people in this room understand that. They understand it when they march for life. They understand it at Notre Dame. And that's why ultimately I'm optimistic not just about roving overturned, which I think it will be in, in, in pretty short order, but the longer struggle that you all have talked about is a struggle about love and friendship. And, and that's, that's what is, you know, anchors the entire right to life movement, culture of life movement. And that's, that's why, you know, we can all be optimistic about it. Couldn't agree more. I, the way people's minds and hearts are changed are by that personal encounter, are by the witness of you all and how you, how you live your lives of humble service, right? That's what does it. Um, let's, let's have some time for some questions here of this remarkable panel. Um, and we'll start over here. If you have a question, just come on over and get in line over here behind this microphone. And please state your name and where you're from. Uh, and I'm going to say something my colleague John Carr says all the time, which is please state your question in the form of a question. Um, go for it. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm John Rendon. I'm a senior here at Georgetown. My question is, in your opinions, uh, what in the Constitution, if at all, lends itself to a pro-life definition of legal personhood? And given, on the one hand, the norms of the Declaration of Independence, but on the other hand, the logic of liberalism, do you believe that these things in the Constitution, should they exist, are they sufficient for um, you know, the pro-life movement in the future. Uh, Mark, Mark, you want to take sure. that? <laughs> I'd be happy to. Um, one, to, to take the second part of your question first, um, could you envision a world where you do something more expressly in the Constitution to be absolutely crystal clear um, that we understand that human beings and human persons and, and everybody in this room and everybody walking around started as a, as a person at conception, sure, we, you could imagine doing a more express 
change to the Constitution. Um, I think that there are two things you can think about in terms of how did the Constitution get misinterpreted to say there's a right to abortion. One is they misinterpreted the word liberty, right, to pretend that um, when it says in the Constitution that um, your liberty can't be taken without the due process of law. The Supreme Court said, oh, liberty, that, that means there's a right to abortion, right? That means that that's part of it, and it kind of changes over time, and now we think, now we think abortion ought to be in there. Um, that's not very good interpretation of the document or what the people who agreed to the document thought. Um, the pro-life answer to that, um, there are two possible ones. One is just saying, you're wrong. There is no abortion liberty written into the Constitution. You're making stuff up and imposing it on people. All right, so that's one part. Um, the more aggressive part, though, would be to say, look, the 14th Amendment guarantees to every person the equal protection of the laws. Um, and although you know, in 1973, by Roe, and later, we pretend, gosh, I'm not really sure if a baby in the womb is a person. The truth is, like the people, I, I started with this, the American Medical Association, the New York Times, people in 1868, when we adopted the 14th Amendment, actually did understand that they were people in the room. If you look at the, the bans on abortion that existed in every state, or virtually every state, when we adopted the 14th Amendment, they were all under the category of offenses against the person. Right? People actually understood that these were people back then. So I think if you were to make the most aggressive pro-life constitutional argument you wanted, you could use the Equal Protection Clause in that way. And I just to briefly follow up on, on that as well, if you want further reading on this, my colleague Jerry Bradley, my colleague John Finnis, and there's a young man who is a law student wrote a very interesting piece, Josh Craddock, in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, arguing for an originalist understanding of maximal personhood, that is, personhood of the unborn child. And just to follow up on what Mark was saying, in 1868, a couple months after the Equal Protection Clause and the Due Process Clause were all ratified, the state of Ohio banned abortion from conception to natural death. These are the same people that ratified the, uh, the, uh, the, the 14th Amendment because it was, in the language of the committee, child murder. So there was no question that people thought persons included the unborn. If, if one's constitutional mode of interpretation is the original understanding, I think you have a pretty, good, a pretty good grounds for that. Although I would say, descriptively, I'm not sure how many currently seated Supreme Court, Court justices would agree with that. I think their posture is the Constitution's silent, therefore it's a matter for political resolution. What do we have? We have a lot of people in line. Why don't we have three of you come up at a time and ask your questions? Thanks so much for that wonderful question. So why don't the next three of you come on up, state your name and where you're from, and your question, and then we'll just have three questions up here and we'll select from among them. Go for it. Okay, um, my name is Christina Simon. I go to St. Peter's University in Jersey City. I'm a sophomore. Um, I have a lot of pro-choice friends, and I always, like, we have healthy debates. We don't get in any arguments, but there's one question that I never really know how to answer, and it's, there are so many kids that need to be adopted, so why, and this is, this is their question. I obviously, I don't know how to answer it, which is why I'm asking, but um, there are so many kids that need to be adopted, so why should we encourage these mothers to go through and have their children over, only to overpopulate? Thank you very much. Come on up. Um, hi, um, my name is uh, Ken Getz, and I'm a student at Boston College. Um, is Just to keep my question really short and simple, is do you think that a pro-life John Rawls is possible, or do you think that within his understandings of political persons and within the things that we can debate that like abortion under his framework could, uh, honest that we could even reach any, uh, is there any arguments that would be considered reasonable to reach any finality on this issue? Thank you. Thanks very much. Come on up. Hello, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Paul, I'm a freshman at St. Louis University. Uh, my question is, St. Louis U. Um, <laughs> my question is, so we live in a very, very divided political climate. Um, and it's obviously like not good. How does abortion impact that divided political climate? And how does the divided climate impact our discussions on abortion? Um, on like a law and also like a law, state level, stuff like that. Thank you, three great questions. Peter, why don't we start with you and then we'll go around if anybody wants to take adoption, talk about John Rawls, we talked about the political climate, go. Really quick for everyone, uh, and this was something that Patricia Bainbridge, who was uh, the chairman of the Board of Human Life International, was Rockford, uh, Respect Life Director, Diocese of Rockford. She used to uh, regularly remind us that there are 
roughly as many parents waiting to adopt children as there are children being aborted every year. There are millions, I believe it's about two million, potential adoptive parents at any particular time. And we're down to about a million abortions a year. So please, I mean, make sure that when folks say, well, you know, who's gonna adopt them? There are plenty of people. And, and I saw numbers recently that the uh, number of, of domestically adopted babies uh, is like at, at a historic low. So if, if you were to, I mean, if abortion were gone tomorrow across the country, there are homes for every single one of those children. Uh, and then I do wanna answer uh, uh, St. Louis. Uh, you know, the red team, blue team thing, and, and look, I mean, I'm on the red team. It just, that's where I'm at. Uh, and so, you know, say for somebody like a, like a Dan Lipinski, you know, a great pro-life congressman from Illinois, you know, um, you know, I even tell him, you know, like, I, I can't come to his events. I mean, I, you know, because it would, you know, taint his brand. Uh, but it, uh, you know, uh, but it is a sort of thing that um, I knew plenty of Democrats in the legislature who were Sunday mass attending Catholics and then were pushing the button for hard abortion. I mean, like, nasty abortion legislation. And it was the sort of thing, what, I mean, at least the way that they put it to me was, I'll get primaried. I'll lose my seat, and can't I do more good keeping my seat but voting in this crazy way? Uh, and, and so th it is infecting, um, uh, infecting our, our, our politics. Um, obviously, if it's in the red team, it's kind of coming to our favor, so I, you know, I don't really look at that as much, but I mean, it is something. You know, I, you know, do you have Republicans that are just being pro-life because eh, you know, I've got to do it in order to keep my seat? Uh, you know, we want everybody to be really pro-life. So I, I would say, you know, we're, we're, I'm trying to work with the Democrats for Life of America. Obviously, not on the political side, you know, I got to be careful about that. But you know, we're, you know, work as legal counsel and helping them there. Uh, and I would just encourage those efforts. Again, that's why I would say, whatever your team, the way you affiliate, however you were raised, join up with them and be the pro-life voice there, just to make sure, you know, uh, that 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 voice is being heard. Uh, just two, two quick points. One, on, on the divisions in the divided society. Um, I won't say it's all about abortion, but it's an awful lot about abortion, right? I mean, the truth is, if you think about Supreme Court nominations, um, you saw the Kavanaugh fight. Um, those of you who are my age would remember the Clarence Thomas fight um, or the Robert Bork fight. Guess what? Before the Supreme Court decided that they can make up what the answer is on abortion, people did not have World War III over judicial appointments because they thought the judges were just supposed to interpret the actual written document that the people agreed on. It was after we got the point that said you can make it up and you can make it up to be abortion that people decided it's a life and death fight. So that's, that's one on the division. I think a lot of it is driven by the desire by some to protect abortion um, no matter what the actual right answer is. Um, and on the John Rawls question, I'll just point out somebody had a great sign at the march yesterday that said, have you ever noticed that everyone who's pro-choice has already been born. And you know, from a Rawlsian point, I'm not much of a political theorist, but for, from a Rawlsian point of view, they're already on the other side of the veil of ignorance, right? Like they, they've already gotten past it, so now it's, it's easy for them to say, yeah, the people who are big enough should definitely get to decide to kill the people who are too small and in the way. Um, pretty hard to think that if you were on the other side of that veil, you'd say, oh yeah, I sign up for my life doesn't matter unless somebody wants me. Um, so. Tim, that's my John Rawls argument yeah, just, as an amateur. I, I just a quick, quick John Rawls comment. I, I, I think actually Michael Sandel, who is not pro-life, uh, has a beautiful critique and, 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 and deconstruction of John Rawls. And John Rawls's conception of the self makes it highly unlikely he'd ever be pro-life. And in fact, there's this sort of unexplained weird footnote in, 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 in one of his books, I can't remember which one, where he basically says, of course I'm not pro-life, and even says something about disabled people and youth. It's a very disturbing, footnote, but the, it's the Procedural Republic and the Unencumbered Self by Michael Sandel that basically talks about how the conception of the self that underwrites Rawls's theory is a kind of reductive, atomized individual that, that can't have constitutive attachments. Uh, and if you can't do that, it's hard to see how you would care about the other enough to be pro-life. Yeah. Um, Couple points. Uh, first of all, on the adoption, uh, you mentioned uh, people with disabilities, and there's so many areas where uh, where we see potentially in the law, potentially in policy, um, this kind of 
of idea, you hate to use the term um, easy out, but because it's not that, it is not that for the woman, and obviously in so many ways, but, um, but, but there's, this, there's this way in which you see these red herrings, like, um, you know, there's so many children waiting to be adopted, there's so many, um, you know, trying to, trying to distract us from the heart of the issue. And the heart of the issue is that there are real children, real lives, on the line, that there's you know women's health and safety, that there's our mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being for decades into the future as we mark birthdays. I would have a a, a child who would have turned 18 last fall, um, and and it is simplistic. It is simplistic because when we talk about oh we need to legalize abortion because when when we don't have legalized abortion then there's so many people on a waiting list. Not only is that factually wrong, but it also it, it it strips away um, uh, desire and, and enthusiasm and funding for alternative solutions, for life-affirming solutions that take a holistic view of care. And we see that in, in a lot of different contexts, but, but perhaps it especially hits home when it is that life or death issue uh, of abortion. Um, when it comes to the, the political question, the kind of red-blue question, it, for me, it, it's hard to imagine how you can get anything much right if you aren't right on the most fundamental right that we have, the right to life, you know, listed first in the Declaration of Independence, and, and we can't exercise those other rights if we don't have a right to life. Um, that said, we are nonpartisan. We will work with anyone who supports life. And the thing is, most Americans do get it right. Maybe not all the way right. Maybe they wouldn't be sitting right here in this room like you all are, and, and I appreciate every single one of you, but, um, but most Americans do at least want a major rollback on legalized abortion. They at least say, well, well we can come together and have a consensus on at least late term, on at least you know, this issue or that issue. And, and these are issues where most Americans, most Democrats, most everyone agrees let's support life. And so, you know, we start rolling back and we can get to the point where we are working together and we are building the relationships and having the encounters um, and creating these, um, these connections that are going to change hearts and minds uh, across the political spectrum. Thank you. Um, I hate that we can't get to every question. So what I'd like to do is maybe have three more of you come up to the microphone and we'll go through your questions and then we'll come up and I'd like to we'll offer those three questions to you all and can you also, when you answer, say, where do you see the pro-life movement in the next 10 years, 10 years from now? So how about we have three of you come on up and then we'll fold those questions in. Tell us where you're from and uh, your name. Hi, I'm Thomas Wilkin. I'm from um, Benedictine College in Kansas. So my question is, um, concerning the Supreme Court decision this last year on the case from Indiana, um, why didn't they choose to uphold the Indiana ban on selective abortion? And then um, on a more general level, is there any legitimate argument for not overturning Roe v. Wade in one fell swoop? Thank you. Name and where you're from? Hello, uh, my name is Clarissa and I'm a student at St. Louis University. Um, so my question, yeah, go Bills. Um, so my question is, well, let me preface this. You all are probably hated by at least one person in the world. Would that, that's just to put it frankly. So I would just like to ask, like, how do you navigate people, like family members or friends who are fundamentally against what you stand for and maybe like disassociate from you because of what you do? And like, how do you just take hatred on a, on a broader scale that you receive from like the public or any other figures. Thank you. Hello, my name is Elena. I'm from the University of St. Thomas in Houston. And, <laughs> and my question involves the difference between morality and religion. I think a lot of people within the pro-choice, pro-abortion movement see morality as something that is always tied to religion. And obviously with natural law, um, that is not the case. So how do we make them see that a law that is moral and upholds the dignity of human life is not inherently religious? Okay, we've got some great questions here to talk about. We've got Roe on the table, whether we should just overturn it. We've got uh, in the Indiana, Indiana case, um, the difference between morality and religion. And what do you do in those difficult conversations when it seems like people hate each other? Um, why don't we start with you, Catherine, and just go down. And also, if you can wrap it up by saying, where do you see us in 10 years from now? Pick wow. One. Pick one or two. 
<laughs> or for all of them. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to unpack. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So a couple things. Is there a legitimate reason not to overturn Roe right now? Uh, I guess short answer, no. Um, but on the other hand, we do want everyone to come alongside. And we saw again, a, as we saw a, a swing towards life after New York, we saw a swing back in the other direction um, uh, after, after Alabama. And so we need to, uh, this isn't just a legal thing. We need to be building relationships, having encounters, educating our friends and neighbors and colleagues. Um, I guess on that, uh, I'll, I'll turn briefly to um, to the idea of people who probably hate me. Um, I, I, I am, I'm here in DC. <clears throat> I like a lot of baseball teams, but I was very excited about the Nats this year. And, um, and so I was, uh, the, the night we won the World Series, I was going on Twitter, I'm clicking like on every single pro Nats tweet I see. Um, and all of a sudden I, I gasp because I am not paying attention to who's tweeted it. And I noticed that the one I had just hearted was from Elise Hogue, um, who <laughs> uh, probably one of those people who might, might hate me, um, certainly rather um, pro-choice, um, runs NARAL. Um, so, and I thought, you know, what do I do? You know, do I, do I go all in and respond? Do I, do I unheart it? Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> would she know? Would she have a notification already? Um, and, and I decided to leave it, and, and I almost retweeted it just to demonstrate that no matter what our differences are, there is so much that we agree on. It's, it's, it's like the DNA thing, you know? We have so much DNA in common with every single other person and, and, and other species even, you know, we have so much commonality. Um, it's really a beautiful thing, and so I, I always try to build on that. I can have a conversation with literally anyone, even if they're, you know, coming at me, chanting slogans. You know, I, I just want to find that commonality, and um, and find the points of connection. I, I think that's where we can where we can really demonstrate uh, love and, and be a voice of life in their lives. Um, briefly, also on, on that Indiana case, it is such an important case. Um, Justice Thomas wrote one of his many, many excellent opinions from last term on that case, on the Prenatal Non-Discrimination Act that, um, that the court did not decide to take up. Uh, they, they upheld per curiam um, the, the fetal remains aspect of the case that, that that question presented, but they decided not to take up the, the discrimination. Um, but he went through about 20 pages outlining the eugenic history of abortion in America. And it was, it was eye-opening for so many people who aren't aware of that. So I would say, go read that. Um, he explains, as does the court, why they didn't take up the case. There isn't a circuit split yet. He says, this is an issue. This is something we're going to have to address. But, um, but maybe we're not there yet because we're looking to see this circuit split. We're looking to see another lower court go the other way so that we really have um, that, that that breadth of analysis at the lower level. And so where do I see us going in the next 10 years? I was up on stage at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia last fall debating the woman who argued Planned Parenthood v. Casey uh, for Planned Parenthood. And she said, this is the court that will overturn Roe v. Wade. Is it this year? We don't know. You know, certainly the court has an opportunity to revisit the precedent that led us here. Uh, it may or may not be this year. It may or may not be this decade. I, I think we have a good shot that it will be this decade. But I do see us continuing to break ground and make gains. We're gaining on public opinion. We're gaining with the abortion rate, which is the most critical of all. More and more women, even in unexpected pregnancies, um, they're choosing life. They're choosing parenting. They're choosing placing their children in a loving home through adoption. They're choosing life. And we're making progress uh, with the, the legislatures. We're making progress in the courts. Justice Thomas, an incredible defender right now. And um, in the legislatures, 25% more life-affirming bills uh, passed last year, last term, in 2019, uh, last session, than in 2018. So more and more states, more and more lawmakers are responding to the people, and they're saying, we no longer want to follow and be beholden to the special interests. We're going to listen to our constituents, and they are pro-life. Thank you.
Uh, Peter, right. one of those questions, let's put you, either one of the questions that were asked or pro-life sure. in 10 years. And, and uh, uh, you know, the Roe can be overturned tomorrow, uh, should be. I, I think, frankly, you should just rip the Band-Aid off because all Roe does is put it back to the states. And notice our, our questioner was from Kansas, from the University of Benedictine in Kansas. Kansas Supreme Court just read a right to abortion into their state constitution, as did the uh, Supreme Court of Iowa recently. So you're seeing where this is going uh, going forward. You, you know, Roe going down is not going to end this, even if you think you're in a, in a nice, safe, pro-life state. So we are going to have to continue to be fighting these things uh, time after time after time. And that does dovetail into, uh, you know, where are we going in the next 10 years? Yeah, I, th I think we're going to have Roe overturned. I, I, it may take a sixth justice, uh, you know, uh, you know, if, if uh, President Trump is reelected, you get a six Supreme Court justice, so maybe they feel more comfortable. Um, but again, that, that sort of thing, we're, we are really splitting into, now we're gonna have red state strategies for pro-life and we're gonna have blue state strategies for pro-life. And so that's how I see it kind of going forward. And it's, it's going to, yeah, you'll bleed over a little bit, but really, depending on where you live, it's going to change the way that we, uh, we do our interfacing. I mean, in, in Illinois, what am I trying to do? I'm just trying to stop taxpayer funding of abortion, trying to maintain my parental notice law. Uh, something like that, you know, and, and, you know, in the red state, you know, we're going to be looking to do everything humanly possible to regulate abortion clinics and shut them down, uh, you know, providing, you know, actually direct public funding for uh, crisis pregnancy centers. So we're going to have kind of that going forward. Uh, and, but again, through that fight, that's why I would, again, encourage everyone to get involved in your local political organizations to try to, to try to start that conversation and build the relationships you're going to need to make those changes over the next 10 years. How about you, Carter? Yeah, I, I think that Roe v. Wade's gonna be overturned within the decade, and I think it's really essential, and it's hard to do when you don't control the organs of media, and you don't control uh, the entertainment industry, and you don't control elite academia very much outside of a, few, you know, a couple of universities and a few pockets within a couple of universities. It, there's an essential strategy that has to be executed in terms of communication and education up to and after Roe v. Wade gets overturned because the narrative is this is Armageddon, women will die, they're gonna go to the back alleys, there's gonna be all these terrible parade of horribles that have been rolled out that, that have to be explained and, and people have to understand that this isn't the case and that and, and, and all, and these women aren't gonna suffer and, and that the world isn't gonna end the day after Roe v. Wade is overturned. And that falls to you, it falls to us, and we have to be patient and, and charitable and thoughtful and loving and explaining uh, the truth of the matter and also acting in a way that puts people more at ease in terms of, again, crisis pregnancy centers, maternal group homes, other kinds of entities that provide care to people who are in distress to show that it doesn't create a pr proliferation of you know, poor people or people resorting to self-harm to try to do their own abortions and so on. I think that's so important to underscore that a lot of this is about making sure that we emphasize that women receive the care that they need to support them to have a real choice. Great. So two, two quick answers. One on being hated. Um, <laughs> you know, if it's somebody in your family, I would say, you know, more love and calm discussion is, uh, is always good. And letting people see why you're pro-life and what you care about and that you're not anti-woman, you know, I represent the little sisters and they get, you know, they get put on lists of people who are anti-woman, like the little sisters of the poor, right? You know, <laughs> just, but being clear about why you believe what you believe and you don't believe it out of hating women or hating anybody else, you believe it because you think there's an actual human being there. And then um, to get to the last question, somebody asked about religion and morality um, and, you know, to say, when you argue about abortion um, and you're, you have to be arguing with a religious person, go all the way, make your religious arguments. Um, when you're arguing about abortion with somebody who doesn't share your religious beliefs about it, um, I, I would just recommend, you don't need to, it doesn't need to be a religious argument and I'm not sure you help it by making it a religious argument, right? People say, oh, you believe the baby's alive after conception because you're Catholic, right? That's ridiculous. I, I don't believe that because I'm Catholic. I believe it because I can read science, right? Because it's just, it's true. And, and when the other side wants to stop listening to you, when the other side wants to go, ah, I don't hear it, I don't hear it, they, they say, oh, well, that's because of your religion, right? So don't let people do that to you. Just have a calm, honest discussion about the basic science, there's a real human being here, the basic moral principle that really everybody else shares too, which is you don't kill innocent people because they're weak, right? Just bring it back to those basic human morality things. You don't need to go to religion, and religion is actually something that lets them 
tune you out sometimes. So um, I, it's not to say don't, don't have the religious beliefs about it. The religious beliefs surely inform why many of us are in the room. Um, but when you're having discussions like that, you don't need it, and it lets the other side ignore you. So just hit them with the science and just talk facts. It's hard to ignore. Well, and another way to say that, right, is meet people where they are. Walk through the open door. That's, how, that's what we're all about here. I want to please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists today. Thank you so much, Kim, for leading such an engaging uh, conversation. And thank you again to all of our panelists. I hope that this year's conference has been an opportunity for you to think more critically about various issues pertaining to human dignity engage with like-minded individuals, and are prepared to leave this place to build a culture of life in your own communities. It's hard to believe that we're almost at the end of today's events. However, um, we do have two, um, or three rather, remaining things. Uh, first, I want to invite our Mass for Life coordinator to provide further details relating to the Mass. Um, and after Matt speaks and we are led in prayer by one of the Sisters of Life, we will introduce our surprise guest speaker for brief closing remarks. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Crandall and I'm a sophomore here at Georgetown. I serve as the coordinator of the Mass for Life on this year's conference board. Please join us at 5 p.m. for the Mass for Life in Dahlgren Chapel, which will be celebrated by His Excellency his Excellency, Wilton D. Gregory, Archbishop of Washington. Dahlgren is located behind this building. After our closing prayer in a moment, you can exit via the first floor and walk through the courtyard to get there. Finally, we would like to acknowledge the Sisters of Life, especially Sister Bethany Madonna, who spoke this morning, and to all the sisters who are in attendance today. We are so grateful to the sisters for their continued support of and presence at our conference. It is my honor to welcome Sister Cora Celli to the stage to close our conference in prayer. At the close of this conference, we turn to our eternal Father with grateful hearts for this deeper encounter with the gift of life, we ask that all the graces received today be sealed and strengthened, and we ask to be inspired by the Holy Spirit for new insights from these talks and conversations. We'll close with a prayer for a life that was written by Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. We pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, you who faithfully visit and fulfill with your presence the church and the history of men, you who in the miraculous sacrament of your body and blood render us participants in divine life and allow us a foretaste of the joy of eternal life, we adore and bless you. Prostrated before you, source and lover of life, truly present and alive among us, among us. We beg you, reawaken in us respect for every unborn life. Make us capable of seeing in the fruit of a mother's womb the miraculous work of the Creator. Open our hearts to welcome generously every child that comes into life. Bless families, sanctify the union of spouses, render fruitful their love. Accompany the choices of legis legislative assemblies with the light of your spirit, so that peoples and nations may recognize and respect the sacred nature of life, of every human life. Guide the work of scientists and doctors so that all progress contributes to the integral well-being of the person and no one endures suppression or injustice. Gift creative charity to administrators and economists 
so they may realize and promote sufficient conditions so that young families can serenely embrace the birth of new children, console married couples who suffer because they are unable to have children, and in your goodness provide for them. Teach us all to care for orphaned or abandoned children so they may experience the warmth of your charity, the consolation of your divine heart. And together with Mary, your mother, the great believer, in whose womb you took on our human nature, we wait to receive from you, our only true good and savior, the strength to love and serve life in anticipation of living forever in you in communion with the blessed Trinity. Amen. John Cardinal O'Connor, pray for us. Thank you so much, Sister Cora Chaley. Um, there was one quick announcement from the registration table. If you've lost a debit card, um, we're currently holding it down there. Um, I can check the name right here. Um, Mia Angelina Shainer, um, your debit card is down at the registration table, so feel free to grab it on your way out. Um, this has been such an amazing day, and I can't think of a better way to conclude than with closing remarks from a special guest speaker who I am so honored to introduce to you now. She was first elected to Congress at the age of 31 to represent Southwest Washington's third district. She's the first Hispanic in history to represent Washington state at the federal level. A senior member of the U.S. House Appropriations Committee, she has developed a record of working productively with both Republicans and Democrats on important issues. She has had three children since serving in Congress, Abigail, Ethan, and Asana, and her personal experience as a mother inspired her to co-found the Bipartisan Maternity Care Caucus, which focuses on legislation and policies to improve the lives of mothers and babies. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler. Oh, what a pleasure to be here. Um, I hope everybody has had plenty of coffee. I, they told me I had about 45 minutes, no? <laughs> Just kidding. I, I am so thrilled, although I understand I'm following a pretty um, amazing couple, probably several panels, but um, folks who are in the fight and are doing amazing work. So this is a, a privilege for me to get to be here. Thank you for this invitation. You know, um, I have been passionate about the pro-life work movement since I was very young. I can remember my mom used to take us to the March for Life in my home state, in Washington State, um, you know, when we do it in different areas, in different cities. And so this has been something that's always been part of my passion um, and part of my, it really just part of my motivation. This has always, always spoken to me. But it became very real for me <laughs> uh, a few years ago. I, I um, sorry, I'm going to try not to read anybody else's notes up here. Uh, it became very personal when I was pregnant with my first child, Abigail. So I have three now, Abigail, my husband and I, Dan, Abigail, Ethan, and Asana, who's, so it's six, uh, three, and eight months. Um, yes. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of makeup under my eyes. But when we were pregnant with my first, I was, had just started my second term in Congress, and we went for our... Uh, I should, I'll tell you the story, but I should tell you that our story is one of a, just a devastating diagnosis, but then one of taking a risk, contending, believing for life, and then ultimately a miracle. And it, it is one of those things where I was honored to be given the opportunity to have Abigail Rose Butler, <laughs> but it also has, has uh, taught me a lot about what it means to really walk out what I believe. Um, it's not just a statement for me. So um, take it back, I was our first uh, ultrasound. So it was our 20 week ultrasound. Um, I think I had just crossed into my, I'd been in my second trimester and we went for the anomaly scan. Um, 
we uh, were excited, first time parents. I just remember the technician was doing the scan and we were t babbling about stuff and you know whether we were gonna find out the, the sex or not. And he just kind of got very sullen. He got very quiet. And I remember he, he stopped and he looked at us and he said, your baby has no kidneys. And I had no idea what that meant or what the ramifications were, but I knew it was serious. And we, this was at George Washington Hospital. Um, it was at one of their clinics. And then we sent, they sent us to the hospital to meet where the doctors were waiting for us. You know when a doctor is waiting for you at a hospital versus the other way around is, is not good. And we weren't prepared for what we were told. Uh, we were told that uh, our condition, that the condition she had was 100% fatal. It's called bilateral renal agenesis. And it means basically neither kidney formed, which meant that there was no amniotic fluid in my womb. So I didn't know this, but the, the kidneys in utero and the baby are what produce the amniotic fluid. And the amniotic fluid is the cushion. So your womb is a muscle and it, it's, you know, it, your baby's in there and the fluid is kind of the cushion. It allows them to, it allows their lungs to grow and to develop. So without, this is a very unscientific way to say it, but without the fluid, their lungs are not given a chance to grow and to develop. They can't exchange oxygen. We were told that with 100% certainty, if, if she made it to term without miscarrying, uh, she would suffocate upon birth. Full stop. That's it. And I cannot express to you uh, the, the pain and the fear and the horror that just filled us just with hearing those words. And, and keep in mind, at that moment, she's moving around, she's wiggling, you know, she's a 20 week old. Um, she doesn't know that she's kind of squished like a pancake. Uh, and I'm being told there is no chance for her to live. It has never happened. They obviously um, offered, you know, one of the way the doctor said it was, you know, when I give women this diagnosis, they're across the street. So we were at one part of the clinic and he was pointing to the regular hospital. They're across the street scheduling their termination, which was his obvious option for us. And we're, we were reeling. And I, 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 you know, it takes all the air out of your lungs and you're presented with just this horror that your, your baby's done. You know, when parents are told that their baby is not gonna survive or that they won't have a quality of life, they're told their best option is to start over or to hit reset emotionally and try again. And, and I was told by subsequent doctors and, and second opinions, just hit reset. If you're not willing to terminate, then maybe we should do a, uh, we should induce and bring the baby early. And I said, well, how early? And, and they're like, now? Well, I, I was only 22 weeks at that point. So it was the same, it would have been the same outcome. I don't think when they're told that, they're actually given a choice. Um, my husband, Dan, and I, we cried and we prayed. And in a very short span, I, I feel like God gave us just this, this uh, faith to contend for her. I felt like both of us, we, we, she's alive right now, and our job is to be her parent right now. And whatever it means to contend for her, we're going to do it. So we... <laughs> We tried something that had never been successful before, saline infusions in utero to mimic the amniotic fluid. Now, at the time when they'd done the first infusion, her feet were clubbed and her chest was squished and her head was very misshapen. Oftentimes, Potter's babies are born with a lot of malformations because they've been squished without that cushion. Um, over the course of about five infusions, I got my first one at 24 weeks. Took a long time to find, I got kicked out of more than one <laughs> practice. It took a long time to find a, a physician who was willing to try, because they're from, from the outset, they're told there's no way this will work. Don't, don't provide false hope. So we had, to, we had to really, really fight to find someone who was willing to give us a chance. But over those infusions, our baby girl developed lungs, even without kidneys. Um, you know, our diagnosing, doctors had given us their professional, honest opinions. They weren't lying to us. They weren't trying to do something mean. They had just never seen this work. But 
for us, we needed to prove that you could try. And that was what we found. You know, I, I, I recognize doctors are not infallible, but we would never have known had we not, fa we had, had we not tried. And through very divine intervention and uh, some courageous doctors who are willing to take that risk, we now get to experience Abigail Rose Butler, a happy, healthy six-year-old. Uh, she's a big sister, and she does say that someday she's gonna be the boss of mommy's work. <laughs> Look out, Speaker Pelosi. <laughs> you know, since our story went public, I have now talked to moms all over the United States and internationally who, like me, carry their baby into their second trimester, only tri second or third, only to then be given that devastating diagnosis. And on a side note, you know, my, um, my colleagues and my, some of my friends, my pro-abortion friends, will argue this point. They'll say second and third trimesters, when they get that dev devastating diagnosis, it's, 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 you're, you're giving the mom a lifeline to give her an abortion at that point. Well, that was my case. That was us. Um, and we said, actually, this is when we should be fighting for this. If the doctors, so they were wrong about our diagnosis. What if they're wrong about those other diagnoses, right? What if we use this entire discussion to go on the offense against the potential disease instead of attacking the pregnancy itself? You know, Abigail is the first survivor of bilateral renal agenesis, but she is no longer the only one. And what if, together, we can break new ground and find new treatments that will benefit more than just our own families? What if the baby won't have that significant medical or health condition that they're being told uh, their diagnosis is? Or what if they do have that diagnosis, and what if every baby was at least given that shot to reach her true potential? Who is a nation, I, I think this often, who would we be? What richness would society get to see instead of the equivalent of two generations missing because of that choice? Would we have already witnessed one of those individuals discovering a cure for cancer or the key to e eradicating extreme poverty? You know, amazingly, there have been many successful interventions in utero. There's hospitals who do these often um, for different conditions. You know, they've already uh, cured spina bifida in utero in a few successful cases. And this is the kind of groundbreaking medical uh, scientific advancement we as a nation are capable of experiencing if we will try. What if instead of spending millions of dollars on abortions every year, we invested that money into finding a cure in the womb for other medical conditions like microcephaly or congenital heart disease? What if instead of uh, that money being used to end the baby's life, we used it to end the baby's disease? Because remember, most of these moms in these situations like mine want that baby. What if we gave them that hope? What if we fought for it? And imagine with me for a second, a country where we truly care and value those among us who are born with a disability. We can all think of people we know with a serious illness or disability who have enriched us immeasurably it's difficult to imagine a world where they were never born. You know, I heard Frank Stevens, he's an exceptionally joy-filled disability champion with Down syndrome at a congressional hearing, describe how he is a medical gift to society and that his extra chromosome might lead to the answer for Alzheimer's. And he's right. Our society celebrates diversity. We give ourselves a big pat on the back for it, right? But shouldn't that mean full diversity, which includes all abilities. We step onto very shaky ground when we decide who lives or dies based on one's ability or possible lack thereof in utero. This past year, we've seen radical legislation in New York and in Virginia um, with regard to late-term abortions, even infanticide, it's been brought into the spotlight. And while we don't know what this year or this next decade is gonna bring, we can be confident of this. 
God's miraculous love extends to expectant mothers and unborn children everywhere. And Jesus still does miracles. We must recognize the unborn child as the miracle that he or she really is. A person developing with extraordinary potential and purpose, almost magically, they're literally swimming in stem cells. (laughs) Their regenerative ability in utero is unmatched. And they deserve a fighting chance to live and just maybe reach that extraordinary potential. After all, I truly believe that is the only way our society is going to reach ours. In closing, I know this is exactly what this conference is all about. Um, And more importantly, that's what each of you are here for. That's what you're about. You know, we're not fighting against people. We're not. Just the opposite. We're fighting for people and against the lie that says not all people are valuable. That's our fight. And we, you, especially I'm looking at the young people here, you must win hearts and minds if you're going to win the struggle for the unborn. And, and I believe you can. That's what you are here for. You are very special in that. Thank you for giving hope to expectant mo- mothers across our country, some of whom are facing the most difficult decision of their life. Speaking up for the most vulnerable among us, and again, thank you for declaring dignity over every child who bears the image of God. With that, thank you and God bless. Thank you so much again, Congresswoman. Um, And with that, um, the 21st annual Cardinal O'Connor Conference on Life has reached its conclusion. I hope it's been a wonderful day for all of you. Thank you so much.